In this series of videos I'm designing a Z80 based computer system but I'm doing it the old-fashioned way I'm trying to stick to discrete logic devices as much as I can avoiding the large-scale devices that are available these days and designing something more in keeping with what would have been designed back in the 1970s when the Z80 first appeared. So what I've built so far is the Z80 core so this includes the DRAM, DRAM controller, memory mapping, uh, all the basics required to make a Z80 processor actually run. I've designed a video output system, so this is a discrete text output system, provides all the signals and timing etc required to put text out onto a video display. So this system will not be using an RS-232, it will have an RS-232 but it won't use that as the primary interface. Um, I've put together an interface and converter for a PS2 or an IBM AT keyboard and that takes the data from the PS2 keyboard and it feeds it into an interrupt controller so I've got an 8 channel interrupt control system this computer will be using mode 2 interrupts and so the circuit at the back left is the, in, the hardware interrupt controller and this breadboard at the front that's sitting on top of the Z80 contains a few circuits. These are now the additions to our basic system. And these include things such as the read-write mapping for the SRAM on our video controller board. You can see I've been experimenting with this, making a few additions, improvements. And this also now contains the in-out mapping. So we have mapped in out which is part of the memory mapping but we also need to be able to map the in out ports so where i was using an in out port for the ps2 uh, data input so i was effectively doing an in instruction to get the data from the ps2 interface um, there wasn't any decoding so it was just basically any in instruction it ignored the port and would uh, trigger a read of the data which is obviously not what we want in the final system so we now have properly mapped um, in port control we already had the mapped out port control as part of the bank switching so I've expanded that slightly and we've now got eight um, input channels for the uh, in out ports and eight output channels for the in out ports I did a few other things the main change I've made since you last saw this is in relation to the video output and specifically the cursor control. Now you may have noticed when uh, I showed the screen in the previous video when we were looking at the cursor, it didn't look quite as nice as it could and because we're designing this from scratch we can kind of make it look however we want. And the problem's quite difficult to explain but I'll do my best. So the top um, images here or sketches are what we had and so each of these rectangles is an imaginary box on the screen and this is how the system outputs the text characters to the screen it basically scans each one um, but they're arranged in a way that uh, they were kind of offset to the side of the imaginary box. Now it doesn't matter because they're all offset so it looked like they're all centered. But when we get a problem is when we start trying to um, put a cursor on top of that because what we end up with is the character offset within the cursor. It's off to one side. But more importantly each of these character boxes is nine pixels wide. The characters are five pixels wide but the bitmap for the character is eight pixels wide. And the problem we get, these vertical lines represent the edges of the cursor as we had it. And the problem there is that um, because it's 9 pixels wide, because of the way the circuit worked, it goes right up to the edge of the previous character. And it didn't look very nice, it was kind of difficult to read, the uh, monitor was quite difficult to uh, view anyway because the tube's in fairly poor condition. I have actually rejuvenated the tube since the last video and it has come you know, back quite a lot. So it's a lot better than it was. We'll have a look at it in a few minutes. Uh, 
So I just gave it uh, half an hour on the rejuvenator and it's come back quite well. Usually these types of tube don't really respond but this one uh, has uh, improved quite a bit. Um, but what I wanted to do was change this. Now I kind of always intended to modify the way the cursor was being generated but we needed to get to the point where um, I could really implement what I wanted to do. And so we were using the circuit I've shown up until now in order to do that. But I did gloss over some details of the circuit and specifically they were that when we latched the data into the data latch between the SRAM and the ROM, that data has to then propagate effectively through the ROM. So the ROM has to then um, put the data out onto its output pins. That data then makes it through to the shift register and the shift register then latches in the data. Um, I kind of implied those two things were happening at the same time, but I did uh, explain this partly in a, an earlier video that they're offset. Um, they, those two actions occur at different points in the overall cycle of each character. And it has to do it that way because of the time it takes the ROM to output the data. So when we latch the data into the data latch, we also latch data into the shift register, but it's not the same data. The data we're shifting into the latch is the next address data for the next character, whereas the data that's been latched into the shift register is the previous data that we'd latched into the shift register, which has by now made it through the ROM. So there's kind of an overlap in what's going on, and the reason I designed it that way is because there is a fairly limited time that we have to get the data flowing through this system and it has to flow through continually. We can't stop the beam on the um, tube in order to wait for this. So we have to make sure this can keep up. So while the data is propagating through the ROM, the data that's been latched into the shift register is already being shifted out to the screen. And then in the next uh, character cycle, the data that was previously latched into the latch has by now made it through the ROM. That's latched into the shift register and then the next character we will want is latched into the latch. All sounds very complicated but the point is these two things overlap and what we're latching into the shift register is not the same character that we're latching into the, um, the uh, SRAM latch. And the problem with that when we try to present the cursor is that the circuit for the cursor generation um, was responding directly to what comes out of the latch. So we actually needed a, um, it was only simple, um, effectively a 7-4 latch or flip-flop. And it was clocked by this same clock that clocks the data into the latch. And what it did is it caused the cursor to lag behind what was being put out by bit 7 on the data latch. So it then coincided with the data that had come out of the ROM, which is what we wanted. So it actually displayed correctly and it worked. So I didn't go into that because, as you probably realise, it's a bit um, complicated and wasn't really necessary, especially I was m as I was most likely going to replace it. But the downside is it has this display characteristic because the cursor is the full width of the nine pixel block. It didn't look very nice. Uh, so what I've done is I've changed this. Uh, it's only a subtle change. We're still using bit seven of the SRAM uh, for the cursor control. But I've changed it now so that it's more like this. So we still have the edges of the cursor. They're now one pixel narrower, so the cursor itself is now one pixel narrower than it was. Um, but effectively the characters have been moved to the centre of the, uh, the imaginary rectangle. So it puts a nice gap. It's only one pixel wide, um, but it looks much better. There's a gap between the edge of each character and the start and end of the cursor. And it makes the entire display much nicer. The other thing it does is lowercase characters were shifted off to one side of the, um, the cursor, so they were towards the right of the cursor, and now they're in the centre.
So I'll move the camera, I'll show you the change and uh, then I'll explain the next steps in this project. Okay, so hopefully you can see that the display is now much clearer and that's uh, mostly down to the rejuvenation of the tube. Uh, but uh, also the text display is a lot better anyway. So as we bring the cursor across, um, what you should see is that the characters are now fairly well centered in the cursor. And if you go back and look at the previous video, you will notice that they weren't. So as you can see, the characters look much better. The cursor display is a lot better than it was. And in particular, the uppercase characters look a lot better when they have a cursor over them. Um, before the cursor was a lot wider than the character and the character was not centered in the cursor. And hopefully you can now see that the entire display is a lot better. Uh, also, I've implemented the full cursor. So now it's, it's in line with where the uh, text is being produced. So um, again, that's more in keeping with what we'll need in our final version of the system. So as you can see, I'm making good progress on the project. The next thing I have to do, however, is deal with this um, mess that we have in front of us. It's turned into a bit of a rat's nest. That is kind of the nature of this type of project. And uh, you'll go so far, it becomes uh, messier and messier. Now you can, of course, tidy up the breadboards, make it look a lot better, get rid of the flying jumpers and put in permanent jumpers. Um, but um, again, you get to a certain point where it starts becoming a bit of an issue with uh, loose connections causing it to crash. The physical size starts causing a problem with high speed electronics like this. And these long uh, flying leads uh, obviously causes uh, some problems as well. Um, it also gets messy. We want to start developing our um, ancillary circuits and trying to do it in an arrangement like this would be very difficult. So the next step is to take all this uh, circuitry that's been generated so far and put it onto a single board. There's a bit more I'll be adding to the board as well, but at the very least I need to get all this put onto a single board. So I have already designed the board and um, it should look quite good when it's done, but this will really amount to a fully functional Z80 computer. It won't have many of the bells and whistles um, but it will be a very good test bed for us to use for further development and it will make life a lot easier all these um, jumpers and whatever will obviously uh, be got rid of and we'll then have a nice starting point for adding the extra circuits so as soon as the board uh, comes in i've got them ordered as soon as they come in i'll get one built we'll have a look at that and hopefully it will work and um, from that point on we can start adding the uh, peripheral circuits and devices. Up until now uh, we've, we've been working on the core of the system so all these circuits are really needed to make the system operational uh, but now we've got a fully operational system we can start adding the nice to have but not necessarily uh, critical circuits. So it's getting interesting making progress and in the next video we'll have a look at the board and see if it works.